What up? This is Brett from Roots of Creation, representing the 603 New Hampshire. Just dropped an album, Living Free, and you are watching Wheeler's Weekend Jams live and direct. Make sure you click the button and contribute to their Patreon page and keep this music vibe going. Peace. Wheeler's Weekend Jams live and direct. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in on another episode of Wheeler's Weekend Jams live and direct. Today joining me is Mr. Brett Wilson of Roots of Creation. Now, uh, the Roots of Creation mix underground roots and dub reggae. Um, they have heavy guitars and pure electronic funk, uh, always increasing with high-energy shows, bringing the soul to everybody's dancing shoes. Uh, roots of Creation also cover activism and awareness, helping uh, the North Country Community Radio Students for a Sensible Drug Policies Amplify Project, and Strangers Helping Strangers. Uh, you can listen to their brand new album right now, which just came out, uh, Living Free, uh, now on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon.com, and Google Play. Uh, and uh, Brett, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. No problem, man. So I'm just going to get right into it uh, for the audience. Uh, tell us the main story um, and the formation uh, of Roots of Creation. How did you guys all uh, form, become a band? Yeah, the, uh, the synergy. The synergy, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, we all kind of met, well, the, the founding members, our, our drummer uh, Mike and our keyboardist Tal and I all met at uh, Franklin Pierce College, which is now Franklin Pierce University in uh, Ringe, New Hampshire. Okay. And uh, we just started playing, having fun, playing parties and, uh, you know, we had these kind of uh, legendary parties, and there were these trailers on campus that were made for three people to to live in, and we and there would be a hundred people in these trailers, and it was just crazy craziness. Wow. Whoa! And, and uh, you know, we just had a blast, and we we're just having fun, and and uh, we said, hey, why don't we play a couple clubs and stuff? And, and the people that were going to the parties ended up going to the clubs and, you know, buying tickets and stuff and supporting us and um, put some stuff online for, for free download on archive.org and just kind of grew from there. And then when we, when we, when we graduated, we, uh, you know, moved into a house together and uh, got a booking agent and uh, put out a, you know, an album and and just kind of did our thing and just kind of pursued it and it's just kind of uh you know slowly grown organically from there i guess yeah so it's, it kind of seems like you guys kind of started your own movement in a way uh in in new hampshire um you know how 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 was like the the music scene around that time when you guys started playing shows um was it like really big and the and the reggae scene or was it when, when we started playing shows, we were, you know, I don't know, a lot more focused on, I guess, the, the Northeast jam scene is really big. Yeah. Oh, so there's a lot of festivals and stuff, and that's kind of how I got started in music. I did street team for a lot of these bands, and we, we all bonded over, you know, Fish and, you know, uh, some of the underground bands at the time, like The Slip and you know, uh, John Brown's body for reggae stuff, just like, you know, a lot of the, like the under, just the underground club scene and, and festival scene and us three at, 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 in college, just, we were all liked a lot of the same music, even though, you know, we had differing tastes, obviously, because we're three individuals, but we bonded over like, you know, Rage Against the Machine, Sublime, Fish, and, you know, just bands that were really kind of just creating their own new, unique sound. So that's kind of what we were going for. And, uh, you know, there wasn't really like a reggae scene per se, per se that was like really big other than the club scene, yeah. not like California or yeah. some other places. But, uh, there was at the time, you know, when I was 13 years old before the band, my mom's friend would make me, you know, cassette <laughs> <laughs> mixtapes of reggae stuff. Cause she was like, yeah, what you're listening to, you know, like Operation Ivy Sublime and, yeah. You know, different stuff. She's like, yeah, it's reggae influence, but this is, you know, she'd make me tapes of like Black Uhuru and Culture and, you know, Buju Bantan and stuff like that. And then she took uh, my mom and I and a friend up to the Vermont Roots Reggae Festival, which is one of the longest running uh, 
which was one of the longest running uh, reggae festivals in the United States. So there is a kind of like underground scene, but it's really, you know, it's not known for it. But the, if you dig, you can, you can find it, you know. Exactly. And, uh, you know, uh, so that's kind of, you know, the story. So Cool. You know. Well, other uh, maybe uh, instead of getting uh, Roots of Creation on uh, on vinyl, you should get a cassette tape. You guys should come out with the cassette tapes. <laughs> my my friend where he manages a a local independent uh, music store. We just hooked him up with some uh, some copies of the new CD, Living Free, and okay. and he has kind of like a a bunch of different indie rock projects, and 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 he presses like these limited runs of cassette tapes, and like they sell out. That's and awesome. I, I, I was thinking to myself, I was like, we we're, we printed vinyl, and, and the place that we get it from does the cassette tapes, and I, I was really tempted to look into it, but I don't know if our fans, it's kind of like, as far as when I've seen it, it's like, you know, the punk bands or the metal bands, because we play festivals and stuff, so there's all different, yeah. you know, genres that we, when we play with, you know, sometimes, and so the metal, punk, and indie scene have, have taken the cassette tapes and, and re-embraced them, but I don't know... <laughs> You know, <laughs> I don't know what our fans would think. Yeah, or, yeah. Oh, you can't download it, man? Like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, all these cassette tapes come with a download, like the vinyl. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of cool. I like cassette tapes. I like mediums that you have to commit yes. to to listen. Because when we create, like, something, it's like we're, we put it together. I know a lot of people just pick and choose the tracks or whatever. But when we create it, we're hoping like like a book, you know, you read it. Exactly, yeah. From the beginning to the end, so a cassette tape kind of encourages that yes. you know, concept, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, yeah, you uh, you just mentioned uh, your, your brand new album, Living Free. Um, I was just, uh, how, how was the whole process, um, just creating this album and the actual recording process when you guys went into the studio? Man, it was a really long, long uh, process. It was an amazing experience. We started, you know, this album probably started it out maybe five years ago. Uh, we were doing like 150 shows a year, coast to coast, and we were just pumping out live albums. And the fans really wanted a studio album. They were digging the live stuff because that's really kind of where we we shine. But we thought we needed to you know, create like a studio vision and, and try to capture all these new songs we had. And then we kind of like ran out of money and we were so busy just touring. And, and uh, so we pumped out three live albums and we kind of put it on the back burner. And then, uh, I was at CMJ in New York city and pledge music approached us and, uh, they, they took me out to lunch and, um, you know, they were just, a, they believed in our vision and they thought that our fan base would support us. And, uh, so I thought about it and it was kind of, kind of scary, you know, just to kind of just go, you know, I've always thought about, Oh, a crowdfund thing or a pre-order thing. Like it's just a little bit, if it fails, you know, and it, it doesn't happen just yeah. that, you know, it's just kind of like. You know those trust falls, you know, you did back in the day or, you know, we had adventure education at my high school or whatever. I don't know. You know, you fall backwards. It's like one of those, but if they don't catch you, yeah. you crash to the ground. It's like, you know, I don't know. I just had this fear in the back of my mind, but I did a bunch of research and uh, talked to a lot of people that I look up to and... Um, you know, uh, we went for it and, uh, our fans were very receptive and it was a great experience. We got to see what they really wanted and, and there were, it, it just, our fan base and us, uh, grew a lot stronger. And, um, then we were able to kick it to the next level. We built a huge, awesome team and, um, got some great special guests and we were able to do all these amazing things like, you know, work with some producers in LA and, and, uh, yeah, it was just, it really helped us kick it up to the next level. And so it was worth, it was worth the risk and it was a really fulfilling experience yeah. just connecting with everybody individually. Um, and, and just, you know, I don't know, interacting with the fans, you know, it was, it was amazing. Cool. Yeah. And, um, you know, it seems like, well, for years now, there's been a lot of collaborations with hip hop and reggae albums in general. Um, you guys have, uh, on this new album, you got 
uh, Melvin Seals, Ross MG, Pato B- yep. Banton. Um, you know, how, uh, how, how does the collaboration thing kind of work when you're writing a song? I mean, you guys like come up with a song, you're like, oh, cool, you know, we should, we should get that guy in this song. Like, how, how does that work? I'm always, I'm interested in how collaborations even start. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, that's an interesting question. That's a good question. And uh, I don't know if I've ever been asked that question. Um, but it's a really good question. Um, you know, the, the beautiful thing about, you know, technology, although it's overwhelming, is it, it, it enables you to collaborate with people that are, you know, anywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. And um, it took going out to L.A., on a trip to go see uh, one of my really good friends, uh, John from Silverback Music, out, out in L.A. and um, and his buddy uh, Papa Jake. We were just hanging out for a week, and um, he introduced me to uh, Yeti Beats and uh, Marshall uh, Ross M G out there. And um, you know, didn't really go out there expecting to create. Kind of went out there for fun and to network and just mm-hmm. you know have a good time and, and jam and stuff. But when I got into the studio with Yeti, I, I, I like had a vision for three times a lady as far as like having that kind of major laser new school electro, you know, dance hall kind of pop thing going on mixed with like the old school sublime eighties dance hall, you know, yellow man, kind of style so i kind of told that to him and he just started burning like spliff after spliff and like loaded it into his pro tools immediately oh wow and like he just went for it and i I was just kind of in awe because i was expecting just to like me and john went over there just expecting to just kind of like talk about it and like you know see if we wanted to work together and he just like threw it in there and just started (laughs) on the mpc and like it just started happening, and he didn't finish it. But he had this by the by the time we left and had drinking a little tequila and just kind of hung out. Like he had actually, I feel like maybe even fifty percent finished the remix, and we were kind of all like, "Wow, damn!" Like that was incredible yeah. to see, kind of see him work. And then we went back and forth after a little bit of time, but you know that was just yeah, kind of the, one of the experiences with Melvin Seals. We met him um, at Jerry Jam in New Hampshire, and we were hanging out backstage, and I was looking for a song for him to be on, and we hadn't cut keyboards to our song Struggle yet, Okay. so we didn't really know what direction to take it in, mm-hmm. and that was the last song that we needed to finish on the record, um, so we sent it off to him, and he was amazing because sometimes, you know, I haven't experienced experienced this, but sometimes when you get a guest artist and they're kind of well known, occasionally they'll kind of what's called phone it in and they'll just do it, and then it's like cool, and then it's okay, but it's just like they just kind of just did it, and then they're busy and whatever, and it it, may, it might not sometimes be what you were hoping for, but yeah. he he was very adamant about like okay, is it is this what you guys want? And he actually went back a second time and like laid and laid down a ton more licks because he, he was kind of being really humble about it and just kind of laying into the song. But actually kind of what I wanted more of was a little bit more riffage. So yeah. have somebody like that be so adamant on making sure that you were 100% satisfied with, you know, their musical performance was kind of a pretty awesome, you know, experience to have yeah. somebody and to have all those people want to be involved because nobody's going to do a guest spot unless they believe in the song or they dig it, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's just, that was just like a really cool experience and it just kind of all happened, you know, slowly over the years. You, you meet people at festivals and, and uh and shows we open up for them and and you just kind of keep those relationships going and you know collaborating is a lot of fun you know so it's it's a good time that's awesome yeah not only you know you guys are having having collaborations but you guys are on your own label uh bomb shelter records correct Um, yeah 
you know, it, especially nowadays, it's it's very, I mean, well, it's very difficult to be on a label, um, depending on what your contract is and all of that. Um, how, what was the idea, um, creating your guys' own label? Um, you know, I mean, basically, so, I mean, basically, you guys are kind of, like, independent in your own way, because it's your sure, label. yeah. So, how, how did that all come to be? Well, um, you know, we put out our own releases, you know, back in the day, just through regular, you know, like, CD Baby and stuff, and it was cool, um, and then we had the, you know, the blessing to work with Harmonized Records in, uh, North Carolina for two releases, and, um, you know, it's a tough industry these days, you know, where people kind of, you really have to give them an incentive to want to purchase music, you know, because they're all caught up in going to see the live show or streaming it exactly. or watching a video and stuff. So, you know, I've always wanted to, you know, have a label to showcase our stuff and, and other, I really enjoy, you know, discovering new people and stuff. So, um, and I also like look up to like, you know, Adi DeFranco or Slightly Stupid, where they kind of like, they help, you know, other people discover new music and, yeah. you know, are independent minded, you know, so I always thought that was really dope. So uh, we just kind of had an opportunity for this release since we did the pledge campaign to kind of, do we want to, you know, what do we want to do with it afterwards? Exactly. You know, but kind of the whole thing about the pledge thing was like, we want to do this independent and um, then we end, ended up having an opportunity to collaborate with uh, ILS, who uh, works in conjunction with uh, Caroline and Universal Music Group, to help distribute it. And so we just kind of, uh, like the rest of the record, organically came through. <laughs> Oh. 